Hi, I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. In this episode, you'll meet medical historian Lindsay Fitzharris. Her latest book is The Facemaker, which tells the story of visionary British doctor Harold Gillies, who devoted himself to repairing the traumatic facial injuries sustained by more than 250,000 British and Allied soldiers during World War I's horrific trench warfare. Dr. Gillies' pioneering work gave these soldiers back their lives, and he helped launch plastic surgery as a medical specialty. Dr. Lindsay Fitzharris, who is the face maker referenced in the title of your new book? The face maker is a pioneering surgeon, Harold Gillies, and he rebuilt soldiers' faces during the First World War. This was a time when losing a limb made you a hero, but losing a face made you a monster to a society that was largely intolerant of facial differences. So what Gillies was able to do for these men was not just mend these broken faces and these wounds, but he was able to mend their broken spirits as well. Why do you think readers in 2022 would be interested in Harold Gillies' story? I think it's really important that we reckon with the damage that war has on the human body. You know, there was a surgeon in the the First World War who said that men who save life never get the same recognition and appreciation as those whose business it is to destroy it. So I hope that my book goes a small way towards remedying that and teaching people about the incredible men and women in medicine who've stepped up to help it during those times of conflict. Your book begins with a note to readers, and there's a point I'd like to have you expand upon. You struggled with the decision about whether or not to include photographs of some of Dr. Gilly's soldier patients. Tell me about that struggle and what you decided. Yeah, I didn't want this to be medical voyeurism. Um, These men, you know, were exploited in the past, but they were also hidden. So when during the First World War, when they would leave the hospital grounds, they were forced to sit on brightly painted blue benches so that the public knew not to look at them. And I didn't want to put them on that metaphorical blue bench in 2022. But also, I didn't want to exploit their faces because there is a curiosity around those kinds of injuries. So I made the decision to include their photos. I had uh, extensive conversations with disability activists named Errol Henley about this. And and I decided I would include the photos of the men featured in the face maker, but I wouldn't include any patients who were not mentioned in the book. There is an exception, though. If the patient died in Gilly's care, as in the case of a pilot named Lumley, I didn't include his photos because he wasn't able to finish the reconstructive process. What I did instead was include a pre-injury photo of him in his uniform and a diagram of what Gillies was hoping to do for the surgery. You do write about how difficult it was for people with facial injuries during World War I to find acceptance in society. And I I wonder if you could fast forward to today. You you met with a disability activist uh, regarding facial disabilities. What is the climate like today for people who suffered disfigurement either through war or trauma? I mean, I'm not a spokesperson for the disability community, nor is the disability community homogenous. But Ariel Henley and I had a lot of discussions about, for instance, the word disfigured. That might not be a word that we use today. We might say something like facial difference. But the feeling was, as a medical historian especially, that the word disfigured I felt was appropriate for these men in World War I because they were disfigured to the society they lived in and they faced a lot of prejudice because of that. In terms of, you know, are we more accepting today? Again, I can't really answer that question, but I will point to the fact that in Hollywood, there is this really lazy trope about evilness. I mean, how many villains are disfigured? You have Voldemort and Darth Vader, Blofeld. Um, You have Harvey Dent, who becomes evil after he's disfigured in facial, in and burned. So I think that that is still a problem in society today. A little bit more about you before we learn more about Harold Gillies. Uh, C-SPAN's Book TV covered you back in 2017 for your first book, which was titled The Butchering Art. I pulled a clip just to introduce people to that book, and let's watch. A halo of light from a gas lamp illuminated the corpse lying on the table at the back of the room. The body had already been mutilated beyond recognition its abdomen hacked away by the knives of eager students who afterward carelessly tossed the decomposing organs back into the gory cavity. The top of the cadaver's skull had been removed and was now sitting on a stool next to its deceased owner. The brain had begun to degrade into a gray paste days before. Early in Joseph Lister's medical studies, he came face to face with a similar scene at University College London. A central walkway split the dingy dissection room in half with five wooden tables on either side. Cadavers were left with their incised heads hanging over the edges, which caused blood to gather in congealed puddles below. 
Lindsay Fitzharris, pretty macabre stuff that you're <laughs> writing about here. I heard you uh, on a podcast interview say that sometimes on book tour, grown men fainted. <laughs> to, yes. To talk. How, how, <laughs> yeah. did, how, did you, how did you get into this specialty? Well, you know, I, I was a strange kid. It will, it will not come as a shock to anybody who's followed me on Twitter and Instagram. I was a strange child growing up. My grandmother and I used to go from cemetery to cemetery hunting ghosts. And I think there was always that sort of macabre interest in history. But also, I was just really fascinated with the people who lived in the past, how they died. Um, you know, and I always say that if you don't like history, you might like medical history because everybody knows what it's like to be sick, especially as we, you know, coming out of this pandemic. And so what I do as a medical historian is I fill in those gaps. I could tell you what you would do in 1792 if you had a toothache or what would happen if you had to have your leg removed in 1845. Um, And I hope that people can engage with the past in that way because you really can empathize with a lot of these, these people who lived in the past and didn't have access to the kind of medical miracles that we have today. I have one more clip uh, and and then we'll get to Dr. Gillis. And this is from your YouTube page, uh, a, a series that you do call Under the Knife. Let's watch. Welcome back to Under the Knife. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about this guy's colorful afterlife. <laughs> century, embalming was chiefly used by anatomists to preserve specimens after dissection. They used highly toxic chemicals like arsenic to prevent decay and insect infestation, and over time, many anatomists experienced arsenic poisoning as a result. The nature of embalming changed when the Civil War broke out in 1861. Suddenly, there was an enormous outcry for the bodies of fallen soldiers to be returned to their hometowns so that families could say a proper goodbye to the dead. It was during this period that the foundations of the modern funeral industry were laid, and the embalmer, as a professional, began to emerge. So clearly we learn about our, <laughs> our history through the eyes of, of medical advances. I, I guess I, just to understand more about your specialty, you have a doctorate in medical history from Oxford, and I'm wondering uh, about the field itself. Are there lots of, of you, uh, lots of people who are medical historians? Well, it, you know, I'm, I live in the UK now. I've lived there for about 20 years, despite the Chicago accent that they, they tried to beat out of me at Oxford, but they couldn't. Um, and I'm, you know, so medical history really thrives in the UK. There's a lot of wonderful collections, such as the Welcome Collection with two L's, started by Henry Welcome at the end of the 19th century. So we're very lucky over there, um, medical historians, because we have access to this wonderful archival material. I don't, I can't really speak to the programs in the US. I know that there are some universities who offer PhDs in the history of science and medicine, but I do think it's a more popular subject in the UK. And yeah, there are quite a few of us out there. Uh, A lot of medical historians remain in academia. I call myself more of a storyteller these days, and I write narrative nonfiction for a general audience. Okay, let's turn to the face maker. Uh, When World War I broke out, you wrote that it became slaughter on an industrial scale. Uh, What was the kind, what were the kinds of uh, instruments used in World War I that brought fighting to a whole new level and a whole new set of challenges. Well, there was an incredible number of advances in artillery and weaponry at this time, so much, in fact, that a company of just 300 men in 1914 could deploy equivalent firepower as a 60,000-strong army during the Napoleonic Wars. There were inventions such as the flamethrower, which belched forth fire that destroyed everything in its wake. There were tanks, which left crews susceptible to new kinds of injuries that had never been seen in previous wars. And, of course, there were chemical weapons. Even as gas masks were being rushed to the front, these lethal gas attacks became instantly synonymous with the savagery of the First World War. So men were, ki- they were, they were maimed, they were burned, they were gassed. Some were even kicked in the face by horses. Before the war was over, 280,000 men from France, Britain, and Germany alone would suffer some form of facial trauma. So uh, explain further this observation. You write, Europe's military technology wildly surpassed its medical capabilities. Yeah, so I, there, there was a battlefield nurse, in fact, who said that the, the science of healing stood baffled before the science of destroying. You had so many advances in artillery and weaponry, and you had a medical community who was really trying to catch up with how to treat these wounds. And especially at the beginning of the war, the evacuation chain could be slow. So just getting off the battlefield could be incredibly difficult. There's someone that I talk about named Private Walter Ashworth, who lays on the battlefield during the Battle of, of the Somme for three days. 
days unable to scream for help because he has no jaw. A lot of times these stretcher bearers would just pass these men by because they didn't think those wounds were survivable. So let's introduce Dr. Harold Gillies. How long had he been practicing medicine by the time the war broke out? He always was in his early 30s when the war broke out. So he had been practicing medicine for a fair amount of time. He was an ENT surgeon. Um, He was born in New Zealand, but he was educated at Cambridge. And as an ENT surgeon, he was well-placed to understand neck and face anatomy. But it was really when he ended up going to France, he was introduced to this great need for facial reconstruction by this character named Charles Vladier. He was this French-American dentist. He was bigger than life. He had a Rolls Royce, which he retrofitted with a dental chair and literally drove it to the front under a hail of bullets. And he worked entirely free for the the entire war. Um, And he's really the one who shows Gillies uh, about this need, as I said, for facial reconstruction. He also demonstrates the importance of dentistry when rebuilding someone's face. So how did a New Zealand physician find himself on the front? Uh, What happened really with, were, were they drafted or did many, many of the military personnel in Europe find themselves volunteering? So, yes, so Gillies was born in New Zealand, but at that point he had already uh, moved to Britain and he was educated at Cambridge. As I said, he had a job in London. When the war broke out, he volunteered with the Red Cross initially. And so there was, you know, so many people were volunteering. Nobody thought that the war was going to last that long. In fact, I had read this account of this young man. I think he was about 17 or 18. He uh, he went to volunteer with the army and they said, would you like to stay in the army for a year and or until the end of the war and he thought well i don't want to stay in the army till for a year i'll just stay till the end of the war because everybody thought it would be over within a month so nobody really knew what they were getting into in the situation but there were a lot of medical trained people nurses and doctors who rushed to volunteer to help and they were sent then ultimately to france Tell me a little bit more about Gilly's temperament that you found out in your research. One of the things I remember that you wrote is that the word impossible was not in his vocabulary. Yeah, that's right. And he was one of those kind of infuriating characters who was good at everything he set his mind to. He was a a champion, a golf player. He was a a competent artist, a competent musician. Uh, He was very competitive. And as you say, he when he set his mind to it, he would never take no for an answer. And that really served his patients very well. He also was a sort of a prankster. So when he finally opened the specialty hospital for facial reconstruction, the first of its kind, it was called the Queens Hospital in Sidcup. Um, he would have this alternative persona called Dr. Scroggy, and he would dress up in this alternative persona, and he would sneak in uh, champagne and oysters, all the things that were technically banned uh, if, from the soldiers, and he would gamble with them, and he would you know, it, bond with them. And so he was a really great uh, persona for that kind of situation. He really lifted these men's spirits. How did the other physicians respond to someone that would, would break the rules as he did? <laughs> Well, he was in charge of the hospital, so I think he got away with it in that sense. And when he opened the hospital, too, he had different Dominion units. So there was a Canadian unit, and there was an Australian unit, and there was a New Zealand unit, and then, of course, there was the British unit. And what was brilliant about this was each unit was headed by a, by a surgeon. Gillies was in charge of the British unit, which was the biggest at the Queen's Hospital. But what happened was surgeons are very competitive, and so the standards really rose across the board. And so when he established this hospital, he wanted it to be this creative hub so that everybody could be collaborating and learning from each other because plastic surgery and facial reconstruction didn't really exist as a subspecialty at that point. A couple of more sort of basics about the state of the art at that time. First of all, where's the name plastic surgery come from? So plastic surgery was coined in 1798 by a French surgeon named Joseph Dussault. At the time, plastic meant something that you could shape or you could mold. So in this case, a patient's skin or soft tissue, that's what plastic surgery meant. But, you know, attempts, although plastic surgery did predate the first war, attempts at altering a person's appearance really tended to focus on very small areas such as the ears or the nose, rhinoplasty being one of the most ancient medical procedures on record. So when Gillies enters the First World War and there is this incredible need to remember 280,000 men requiring some kind of facial reconstruction at this time, it really allows plastic surgery to enter a new modern era, one in which new standard, new tests uh, can be new methods can be tested and standardized and become part of the standard practice. In the 19 teens, what was known about infection? It was the age before antibiotics. 
Yeah, so it was before antibiotics. Um, now, at this point, surgeons do understand germ theory. So my first book, The Butchering Art, is all about Joseph Lister, who introduces germ theory in the late 19th century to medical practice. And that was a slow burn. So even during the Civil War, surgeons still didn't, they, they weren't coming to grips with germ theory necessarily. And so you see a bit of facial reconstruction at that time, but it tends to just be restoring the function, making sure that the patient could uh, swallow or speak, but they weren't really concerned with the aesthetics because infection rates could be quite high. But as you say, before the, be, during the First World War, that it was before antibiotics, so infection rates could still be high. And ironically, Joseph Lister, the focus of my first book, sort of creates problems for Harold Gillies in the second book, because what happens is you have this new generation of surgeons who are um, brought up on aseptic and antiseptic techniques, and they're not used to identifying infections actually at this point. So in the early years of the war, they're hastily, these trauma surgeons at the front, they're hastily stitching up these wounds, they're trying to stop the hemorrhaging, and in doing so, they are literally sealing up these men's fate. And when they would end up in Gillies' care, he would have to unpick all of this, he would have to irrigate the wounds, he'd have to reverse the infection. So it was a really long and excruciating process for a lot of these soldiers. What was state of the art for anesthesia in the era? <laughs> that was also a problem. So anesthesia hadn't really progressed since 1846 when ether had been discovered. So you're really talking about a rag over the face with chloroform or a rudimentary mask. Now, if you pick up the face maker and you see the photos that I've included, you will instantly understand why a mask over the face can be very problematic. It'd be very painful to put a mask over an injured face, but also um, it obscured the area that the surgeon needed to work on. So this became a problem. There's a scene in the face maker where Harold Gillies is leaning over a patient and the patient is breathing ether back into Harold Gilly's face and he's getting woozy. So this is not a good situation at all. So what happens during the First World War is you have the developments in facial reconstruction and plastic surgery and in parallel developments in anesthesia. It's kind of like the B story to Gilly's A story. And it was Gilly's anesthetist because that's what they call them in Britain. It was Gilly's anesthetist Ivan McGill who would end up developing intertracheal, intertracheal anesthesia at the very end of the war. Why did you say that soldiers feared anesthesia even more than the surgery itself? Yeah, well, that was the other thing. There wasn't um, a, a way to sort of measure necessarily how much drugs were being were getting into the system. And these drugs could make the soldiers feel very, very sick, very nauseated. So I think there was a lot of anxiety around the administration of the anesthesia. Also, you know, these men were go undergoing cert multiple surgeries over multiple years, sometimes even over a decade. And because these drugs could be very hard on the system, it could weaken the heart, it could cause all kinds of other problems. And in fact, there is a soldier I talk about in the face maker who ends up dying as a result of the anesthesia. What was used for pain medication? You had, you know, this sort of typical, you have morphine and um, opioids and things like that. In fact, one of Gilly's patients, a pilot named Lumley, who I discussed at the beginning, who actually ends up dying in his care, he was a pilot and he crashed and uh, he suffered severe burns. Now, these early airmen, you have to remember, they were taken to the skies 10 years, just 10 years after the Wright brothers. They would collectively call themselves the 20 minute club, the time it took to shoot down one of their planes. And they often brought pistols into those planes, not to shoot at each other but to shoot themselves if their plane had been hit to save themselves from what they believed was a fate worse than death but of course some of them did survive um, Lumley was terribly burned he was sent to the wrong hospital it takes a year before he finds himself in Gilly's care at this point he's highly addicted to morphine because it's a very painful condition he's in a really bad state and Gilly's doesn't want to do the surgery right away and Lumley really pushes him to do it because he's very depressed and he just wants to move forward so against his better judgment, Gillies does the operation and Lumley ends up dying. His system becomes overwhelmed. Um, and it's a very sad story individually, but it's a very important story to the history of medicine and particularly to this subject because it teaches Gillies an important lesson, which is that when you're rebuilding the face, you have to do it in small increments and you should always put off today what you can reasonably do tomorrow, which becomes a principle of plastic surgery. A couple of things about the patients that he normally treated, uh, some pluses, some minuses. First of all, these soldiers were very young. So uh, yes. on, on the a positive side, a, a whole life ahead of them, but also a better chance of recovery. On the negative side, you write about the fact that they went to war with terribly poor dental habits. Mm 
and yes. also that that smoking was excessive in uh, European society, particularly Britain, at the turn of the last century. So how did this impact their recoveries? Yeah, you're absolutely right. They weren't in great health to begin with. And then, of course, when you're in the trenches for months or sometimes years, your health is going to be depleted even further. I had read something like 50 percent of soldiers didn't even own a toothbrush. So the dental hygiene was really poor. Now, when you have a bullet or shrapnel ripping through the face, there's a lot of bacteria and you're already having dental problems. So this was a this was a real challenge. The other thing was that in these trenches, they were giving these men really hard biscuits um, that could crack their teeth and there was just so many problems they were undernourished they were overworked certainly in these trenches and so when they get to gillies um they are often in a very depleted uh health situation and so he really had to re- like rebuild their entire bodies and their systems um and to get nourishment back into them just so that they could withstand the surgery I want to uh, learn a little bit more about what you described as Gilly's idea to create a central hub, the Queen's Hospital. How accepting were, were the British military establishment, his superiors, in some of these groundbreaking kinds of ideas he had for treating facial injuries? So when he meets Vladier in France, the guy who had the Rolls Royce, um, he, he recognizes that there is a need for a, a specialty unit. Um, so he goes back to Britain and he petitions to open a specialty unit at the Cambridge Military Hospital in Aldershot. And they don't really take him too seriously. But remember, these pencil pushers, they were not seeing these kinds of injuries near the front. So, th- so these men back in London, didn't ne- they weren't necessarily convinced that there, there was actually a need for this. Um, but he does end up opening a specialty unit. And he actually leaves the war office. He walks down the road onto the strand he goes into a stationery store he buys some labels and he hand labels them and addresses them to himself at the cambridge military hospital and he sends them to the front and basically he sends a letter saying anybody with a facial wound put this label on their uniform send them back to me and i'll be able to handle it and before long all of these men with these facial wounds end up in his in his hospital ward with these labels pinned to their uniform. Eventually, he is so overwhelmed during the Battle of the Somme that he has to establish an entire hospital because there's just no way that he can take on those kinds of numbers in just one single unit. The hospital was named uh, ultimately Queen's Hospital, and the Queen makes a couple of cameo appearances in your book. What was her her role regarding the the people who were serving in her military and how involved she was with their their needs and their care. The Queen, yes, as you say, several members of the royal family at the time did visit the hospital um, and you know, they were very supportive of obviously the war effort. They want they wanted to be seen as patrons um, of of these this work, this medical work going on. And the queen herself really had an interest in this hospital being established. In fact, there was one surgeon from New Zealand who was really hesitant to actually move to the queen's hospital in Sidcup, and she ends up convincing him. Um, and and again, it was really to the benefit of the hospital and to the other surgeons at the time because everybody could see each other's work. They can learn from each other and the standards rose across the board. Gillies didn't just bring in surgeons, though. He also brought in dental technicians. Um, He brought in photographers, mask makers. He brought in artists. The artists would actually go into the operating theater and they would uh, create pictorial records of what Gillies was doing in the operating room because he recognized the groundbreaking work that he was doing and the need to record that for later generations of surgeons. Well, I wanted to pick up a little bit more because we meet one of the people that he tasks with documenting uh, the work in your book. His name is Henry Tonks. Um, I, before we learn about Henry, why did Gillies understand that it was important to document what he was doing? Yeah, I mean, and he was so forward thinking really in this sense, because remember, again, plastic surgery wasn't a subspecialty in medicine at this time. But I think Gillies recognized that what he was doing when he was rebuilding these men's faces really needed to be documented. And it was beyond his abilities to do this in a visual way. Like I said, he was a competent artist, but he also was busy rebuilding faces and, you know, all the other things that he was tasked with. So he ends up bringing in this artist, Henry Tonks, who's this formidable 
character. He's he's a well-known artist at the time. He actually has medical training himself. And Henry Tonks comes in and he, he as I said, he's the one who creates a lot of these diagrams, um, but he also paints these wonderful portraits of these soldiers. And I include the black and white photos of these men in the book. I did not include the, por- the Tonks portraits because I really believe they had to be reprinted in color as they originally were, and that would drive the price of the book up. But you can certainly find this stuff online. And what was amazing about the portrait was he was able to capture a humanity in these men that I think you don't see in the photos. And he also was able to document the color. So the bruising and, you know, other other aspects of the injuries that would be really important to capture in color. So the work of the artists, and he wasn't the only artist at the Queen's Hospital, the work of these artists was extraordinary and very important to the establishment of plastic surgery. You made reference to prosthetics and masks. There are two people, Francis Wood and a lad, who made facial masks for the soldiers that had had facial injuries what was what was that i'm not sure if i call it a science or an art like uh, and and what did it provide for those coming back with these kinds of wounds and injuries yeah, a lot of people will be familiar with these World War I masks through the fictional character Richard Harrow and Boardwalk Empire. Um, these masks were extraordinary. And if you look at the photos, and there's some photos of these masks in the face maker, they look very realistic. So they these were artists who were offering non-surgical solutions to these soldiers who were injured. Maybe some of these men didn't want to go through painful operations, but also Harold Gillies employed mask makers for the in-between. So remember, as your face is being rebuilt, this could take months or even years. And so the mask could come in as useful to helping you blend into society uh, while you were waiting for their surgery. In fact, there was a soldier who was at the Queen's Hospital and he would wear this mask, but they were really uncomfortable. I mean, they were metal. It was hot. Imagine wearing that over an injured face. So the men generally hated them. And I always want to remind people that these soldiers were wearing the, the mask for you, not for themselves, so that you would feel comfortable looking at them. But he would go out into the city and he would sometimes have to take the mask off because it was too hot or uncomfortable. And when he came back to the hospital, he would hold up one, two, three, or four fingers to show how many people got upset or fainted looking at his face, which is really sad and isolating for this man. But the mask makers were important. And as I said, they're very realistic in these still photographs. But of course, if you were sitting across from someone, it could be unsettling. The mask didn't operate like a face. It it didn't age. It was fragile. And for all of those reasons, it didn't really offer the long-term solution that surgery did. How long were the soldiers typically uh, patients of his in these hospitals, these military hospitals? I mean, it depends. It's, you know, how long is is a piece of string, really? It depends on the severity of the injury. Some of these men, as I said, Gillies continued to operate on for over a decade. Some of them, it, it could have been a shorter stay. Of course, there was always the tension between Gillies' duty to his patients and his duty to the Army, because a lot of these men had to be sent back to the front. Now, in the early years, actually, the Army didn't like these men to be sent back to the front because they thought that the disfigurement would hit the morale of the troops. But as you get to the, towards the end of the war, they just need manpower. And so I always say to people as well that as wonderful as these medical advances were during the First World War, because there were many things that happened in the First World War, there was even the first blood banks that appeared in empty shell casings. These were This was all great. And it served us long since the guns fell silent on the Western Front. But I also came to this grim realization halfway through writing this book that as wonderful as this was, it also served to prolong the war because as doctors and nurses got better at patching these men up, they were being sent right back to the front. And of course, it was feeding the war machine and it was a vicious cycle. And I think we need to acknowledge that part of the story as well. Again, thinking of the the brass or the pencil pushers, would they often, because you talk about how Gillies was really an artist and really emphasized trying to restore these uh, service members to a, as much of their pre-war facial structure as he possibly could. Uh, were there military officers who would say, we stop at this point, we need to get them back to the front? Yes, absolutely. And there's a couple soldiers featured in the face maker who are sent back prematurely, I would say medically prematurely. Um, and this was really disappointing to these men as well, to have to be sent back before their surgeries were completed. And I'm sure that was really frustrating for Gillies and the other surgeons at the Queen's Hospital. Again, that tension between duty to the army and duty to the patient. You write that all was not uh, frivolity and roses amongst the surgeons there, that even though they were uh, cooperative, there were times they became quite competitive. Is that just human nature? Why did that happen? 
I mean, anybody who's a surgeon today will recognize that behavior, you know, in the past. Again, there was that competitiveness, which which could be good because it did drive up the standards across the board. But there was some pettiness and it, it, particularly around something called the tubed pedicle, which is what Gillies invented um, during the First World War. So what would happen is if you were rebuilding somebody's face, for instance, you would need something called a flap because a lot of the tissue was gone. So a flap is sort of like the stakes of plastic surgery and graphs are sort of like the salami. So if somebody's missing their entire nose, you're going to need a flap. You're going to need a meatier piece of tissue to reconstruct the nose. Now, the traditional methods left the flap open on one side, so that could be leaving it open to infection. So what Gillies did was he would take this flap of of tissue and he would roll it like a trunk, like an elephant's trunk. And so all of the tissue inside was encapsulated with skin on the outside, and this would protect it from infection. So he could take a uh, like a trunk of tissue, the elephant's trunk from your thigh, and he could attach it to your abdomen. And once it attached the abdomen, he could sever it from the thigh and he could flip it and move it up to the chest and so forth and so on until it gets to the face. It was really incredible uh, innovation. But what happened was another surgeon after the war that also worked in Gillies Hospital, he claimed that he had invented it. But there is documented evidence to say that Gillies was the first, at least at the Queen's Hospital, to do it. There were other people during the war who were also developing similar methods because a lot of this was evolutionary rather than revolutionary. Again, there was a great need for facial reconstruction at this time. So uh, again, to Gilly's uh, mind and how it worked, you write about how often these ideas would come to us when the the patient was on the table in the midst of surgery. Uh, What did you learn about how he approached uh, and, and how he became so innovative? Yeah, I mean, plastic surgery even today is part science, part creativity. It's it's that that coming together of art and science that really makes it special. Gillies would have to visualize what he was going to do. He would seclude himself in his office before an operation, and he would visualize every single move. But of course, when you got into the operating theater, problems arose. You had to improvise, and he was very good at improvising on his feet. Remember, there were no textbooks to guide him at this point. Although there was some plastic surgery going on in earlier periods, it was never to this great extent and never, you know, the wholesale restructuring of the face. So he really had to make a lot of this up as he went. Um, and he, he was able to do extraordinary things for these men as a result. How was he, uh, he and his fellow surgeons, how were they able to replace bone and cartilage? So they would they would harvest bone and cartilage from other areas of the body, for instance, from the ribs. Um, they could rebuild the, the, the structure of the nose from there. And they did use, again, old techniques. So one of the oldest techniques was a forehead flap that goes back thousands of years, it goes back to a, an Indian method. And now if you take a piece of string from the tip of your nose to the top of your forehead, you will find that the length of your nose is roughly the length of your forehead. So taking a flap from the forehead and moving it down and twisting it over the nose to reconstruct it is a very effective method. And then what you do is you take the remaining skin, which is very stretchy, and you can cover up that wound. Um, So he was using a lot of those old methods, but he was also experimenting with new methods. Um, And it it was there was a lot of trial and error, but he was extraordinarily, you know, talented and and also a little bit of luck. And he was able to really uh, restructure these faces to a, a high level for over 100 years ago. Yeah, but to that end, you write that failure had a constant presence at Queens Hospital. Tell me more. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he did lose patients. Um, I always kind of go back to Lumley as being the example, the pilot who died in his care. And those stories need to be told because, first they're important, as I say, to the history and development of plastic surgery. They teach Gilly something. I always say that failure is very important in science, and it doesn't get acknowledged as, as much as the successes. But really, think about all of the things that fail um, that inform what doesn't work and drives researchers in a different direction. And so that is very important to Gilly's story as well. Um, he has uh, several other patients who die in his care. One of them dies from anesthesia. That's really devastating to him. He couldn't even go to the funeral afterwards because he was so overwhelmed with other patients needing his help. So on a personal level, I think it haunted him. Uh, there were times when he would break down um, you know, on, there's a, there's a scene where he's on the golf course and he's notified that one of his patients dies and he he loses it. Um, so I think on a personal level, it could be very devastating to him. But they these unfortunate lessons did teach him 
how to succeed ultimately. And that's why I include them in the book. How much interest was there in Dr. Gilly's work by the British press at the time? Oh, there was there was a lot of interest. Um, but, you know, unlike the men who were losing limbs, who would be pictured in these newspapers, you know, with smiling with their nurses, you didn't really get images of these disfigured soldiers. And it was really presented in the press, again, as the worst of the worst injury, um, as very ableist language around that, what we would identify as ableist language today. Um, and but but they were fascinated with what he was able to do. And there's a journalist who actually comes to visit the hospital and he's witnessing this surgery in the operating room and he gets a bit woozy um, and he has to actually leave to get some air. And then they sh- they show him at the hospital all these sort of before and after photos. And he's just blown away by the miraculous results. Was uh, Gillies at this point well known in, by the British public? Did he achieve renown while he was still working during this period? You know, there was a like again. There was a little bit of press coverage, um, but he certainly didn't get the accolades that he deserved. You know, it was it was long after the war that he actually received his knighthood, and there were some who sort of rankled at this that he should have received his knighthood a lot earlier than that. But he didn't seem overly concerned with that kind of praise. You know, he was really patient focused. Um, he continued to operate on these men long after the war was over. Um, so, so that story, you know, doesn't end with the war being over. These men continue their painful journeys to recovery for many, many years after. And Gillies was always at their side. I was trying to remember the exact date by which he received his knighthood. It was well into, was it 1952 or earlier than that? Do you remember? No, it was it was earlier than that, but I'd, I'd have to look back as well at the exact but date. Many but it was, years, it was many years after yeah. the war. Yeah. It was it was much, much later than he really should have received it. Um, and when he did receive it, there were so many patients of his that wrote to congratulate him. And one of them said, you will not remember us, but we remember you, you know, meaning that there were so many men that it would probably be hard for Gillies to remember them on an individual level. But they all remembered him. And some of them became very loyal to him. One of them, Big Bob Seymour, who loses his nose, um, actually ends up becoming his private secretary for for the rest of Gillies life. So they really bonded in a way that, for instance, a trauma surgeon near the front wouldn't even know these soldiers' names. Gillies was really able to get to know them on a personal level because of the amount of time he was spending restructuring their faces. Well, one of those is someone we meet a couple of times in your book at at the outset and then later on as the story progresses, Private Percy Clare. What's his story? So I, you know, I wanted to, when I set out to write The Facemaker, I knew that I wanted to drop the reader right into the middle of the battle. I wanted people to understand what it was like to fight in those trenches. What did it smell like? What did it look like? What did it feel like? Now, it's difficult because it's nonfiction. So you have to find enough documentation to kind of bring that story to life. Private Percy Clare got shot in 1917 in the face. The bullet went through one cheek and out the other. And he laid on the battlefield trying to get off for a significant amount of time. And he wrote this beautiful diary about his experiences. And that's why I ultimately chose him. The bad thing about Percy Clare was that he got shot in 1917. So I open with his story in the prologue, but then have to dial the, the, the book back to right before the beginning of the war in the first chapter. But Percy lays on that um, battlefield. And as I said, the stretcher bearers kept passing him by because a lot of times, again, these men didn't think that these these facial wounds were survivable. And so they would just pass by. Anybody who's had a cut on their face will know it bleeds and it bleeds. The face is very vascular. So this could be a real challenge just getting off the battlefield. I was in contact with his, I believe it's great, great niece. Um, Her father had donated this diary to the Imperial War Museum and I needed to get permission to quote from the diary. And I asked her if she knew anything about Percy Clare and she said that she didn't personally know anything. And at one point I discussed in the book about the fact that he had this tiny uh, Bible with him. And when he got shot, he thought he was going to die. And this is before dog tags. And so he took his Bible out and it had his mother's address in it. And he clutched it because he thought, well, if they find my body, they'll at least be able to identify me and tell my mother. And so I asked the great, great niece, I said, what happened to the Bible? And she said, she, she didn't, she didn't even know the story. Um, So I always tell people, you know, keep those, those family items, donate them to museums if you don't want them, because they help historians like me put those stories together. Were dog tags typical at the time for soldiers? No, they developed them um, in, you know, sort of in the middle of the war. They're called um, discs, I believe. And they, at first, they were only given one which was a problem because if they took the disc off the soldier 
um, at, to identify and then notify the family, and then they buried the body. The body then became anonymous if it wasn't recorded, if you see what I mean. So they, so now the dog tags, you would have two. You would remove one um, to notify the family, and you would leave the dog tag with the body. So they were, they were developing all of this as the war went. Um, it had never been seen on the scale, this kind of death um, and destruction on the scale that the First World War. In fact, a lot of these men were sent into the trenches in the first year without really any protective gear, especially for their heads. It was only later in the war that that Tommy helmet that became sort of iconic in the First World War was developed. No helmets. No helmets for the, for the first year. Um, and then eventually they start to create different prototypes. There's one in France and, and finally the British come up with one. Um, and, but yeah, and, and even that Tommy helmet really didn't it didn't give that much protection in the tanks as well. The men had these sort of chain mail masks that they would wear. Uh, you can Google world war one tank masks, but they were really uncomfortable to wear. And so a lot of times the men just didn't wear them at all. And it, and again, it, in the, inside those tanks, if the tank was hit, things could fly off within the tank and hit the men in the faces, or they could be terribly burned. So these new inventions were creating new ways for people to be injured. And that was a real challenge for the medical community at the time. How long did it take for the Germans to deploy chlorine gas? And when were soldiers given gas masks to help protect them from it? So the first gas attack, I believe, was in it was was quite early in the war. I would have to I would have to double check that fact. You know, I'm a medical historian and I'm telling a very specific story. I always say, even at the beginning of the book, this is not a comprehensive uh, history of World War One, nor is it a comprehensive history even of Harold Gillies. It's a particular story at a moment in time. I do talk about the development of chemical weapons early in the war. Um, psychologically, the impact of these lethal gas attacks was enormous. Um, and the, the, they do end up developing gas masks, and these do become sort of synonymous with the brutality and the savagery of the First World War. And it was really terrifying for the soldiers as well to see these kinds of new weapons deployed. And while we're talking about de- their deployment, you also noted in the book that they carried backpacks that weighed as much as 60 pounds when they yes. were deployed to the field. And uh, typically uniforms would have been wool at the time. So Yes. Yeah. 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 I mean... It was awful. I, and, and if you think about it, too, there was a lot of in some of these battles, there was so much rain and mud. You know, there's stories of men just drowning in the mud. They would they would sink into the mud. I came across really horrific stories in diaries and letters at the time. I mean, the extraordinary thing about the First World War was it was the time of of war poetry and war writing. And these men were really recording their feelings and their thoughts in a way that, you know, in, in earlier centuries, it's hard to get a sense of that from soldiers and from patients. So I was very lucky in that way. But also you can get really bogged down in these terrible stories that they're witnessing. So it was uh, a traumatic book to write in that sense as well. I felt very connected to these men in the end. There's a man named Private Walter Ashworth, who I referred to earlier, who laid on the battlefield for three days after he was injured during the Battle of the Somme. He wasn't able to scream because he had no jaw. And his story is both sad and happy because when he is brought to Harold Gillies hospital, his fiance breaks off the engagement. And that unfortunately happened to a lot of these soldiers. But the happy ending was that the fiance's friend got word of this and she began writing to him at the hospital and soon they fell in love and soon they were married. But when Ashworth was uh, discharged from the army, he went back to work as a tailor's assistant and his boss made him work at the back of the shop because he didn't want him to, quote, frighten the customers. And I said in the book that not all wounds were created on the battlefield at this at this time. And I think that's one of the themes of the face maker. I'm not sure if your research included this, but Germany had to be experiencing the same kinds of facial injuries. Was there a lot of pioneering work going on there as well? Yeah, absolutely. There were surgeons that were working on facial reconstruction in Germany. I talk about a man named Jacques Joseph, who was a Jewish German surgeon. He was really well placed to do facial reconstruction because he had actually been doing some cosmetic surgery before the war. Um, at the time, he was uh, he, he, so he so he was really well placed to understand facial anatomy. The difference being, though, with surgeons like Jacques Joseph, uh, there's a, a French surgeon I discussed as well who's doing work they tend to not work in a collaborative way so they're not working necessarily with dental surgeons which was really important to rebuilding the face and what Gillies was ultimately able to achieve 
Gillies really takes a collaborative approach, and, and that's why his work really stood out against other surgeons' work uh, doing that kind of same facial reconstruction at this time. We have about 12 minutes left in our conversation about Facemaker, the story of Dr. Howard Gillies in World War I and his pioneering work as a plastic surgeon and treating the military. Uh, in, in 1918, you write that on top of all of the war, another devastation arrived in the form of the pandemic. Uh, yes. How did that change the medical equation uh, of the work being done to rehabilitate the, the soldiers in the war? Well, it was really sad. You know, we were we were living through a pandemic as I was writing this book as well. And I was based in the UK, so we were under very severe lockdowns at that time. And I, you know, I was I knew I was coming up chronologically against the uh, flu pandemic of 1918. What was really sad was there were people in Gillies Hospital who worked at the hospital who succumbed to the flu, and also some of the soldiers that Gillies had been working on. You know, imagine surviving the war. Imagine surviving a facial injury so terrible and some of the reconstructive process and then dying from the flu in the end. It was really devastating and sad. And the thing about the flu pandemic of 1918 was that it really hit a lot of these uh, younger men and these men whose health was already depleted coming out of the trenches. So the numbers were really extraordinary. The fatalities around that flu pandemic were extraordinary. How in a big medical facility like Queens Hospital would you prevent the, the pandemic from spreading really rapidly? I mean, there was masking. That was more or less all they could really do at this time. Uh, there was no vaccine. Um, it, it was it was very much you know sort of how we we controlled COVID at the very beginning, uh, distancing, masking, um, and you know sort of on a wing and a prayer, hoping that this doesn't spread like wildfire throughout the hospital. But of course, as I said, some of Gilly's patients do die, um, and some of his staff die as well. Um, before we get to the end of the war, I wanted to go back to your working on this during the pandemic. So uh, how did that change the nature of the research that you would typically do for a project like this? Well, I was very lucky because, you know, I have to praise the archivists and the librarians out there because they've been digitalizing a lot of this material. Uh, they work with scholars to get that stuff to them in a digital form. So I was I was very fortunate that I could access this stuff in that way. Um, so there were definitely challenges, though, and there were challenges not just due to the pandemic. There were challenges just accessing these patient files because there's patient confidentiality. So when I talk about a patient by name, it's because Harold Gillies himself printed those cases in his uh, textbook on plastic surgery, The Principles and Art of Plastic Surgery. Um, but if I went into the case notes and I found something that he hadn't mentioned in his book uh, related to that patient, I couldn't talk about it in relation to that patient's name, if you see what I mean. So there were challenges as a medical historian just navigating these archives and the sensitivity of this material. In some cases, I had to prove that these, these men were dead. I mean, can you imagine if I had discovered that one of them was alive and he was 140 years old? So there was it was a much more complicated process than writing about Joseph Lister in the 19th century because you're not facing any of that. Uh, enough time has passed, essentially, in the, from the 19th century to today that you can access all that material without problem. Does the Queen's Hospital, which Gillies helped to promote, uh, still exist in any form? It does, yes. Um, it's it's called Queen Mary's, I believe. I mean, it, technically it was Queen Mary's Hospital at the beginning, but it, it became colloquially known as the Queen's Hospital. Um, but I, I don't know much about the kind of work that they, they still do there today, so... By the time of armistice uh, arriving, then uh, war was over. How long did Gillies continue working at Queen's Hospital? So he, he continued working quite a long time after the war was over on these men. But at that point, as the, as the war ended and things were wrapping up, a lot of the surgeons began leaving the Queen's Hospital. They went back to their private practices. Um, they did not necessarily pursue plastic surgery as a subspecialty. And Gillies really believed strongly that plastic surgery could be very transformative work. And he wanted to establish it as a, a specialty in its own right. And so began the work of doing that. So he continues to work on the reconstructive cases of the soldiers, and he moves into the cosmetic realm as well. And he would say that reconstructive work was about returning something to, quote, normal, whereas cosmetic work was about surpassing the normal. And he was excited by both of those challenges. But uh, as you describe it, there was a lot of pushback at the time about continuing plastic surgery, that people felt that, that it was, uh, when it was not reconstructive, when it was in fact cosmetic, it was all about vanity. So how did he fight that perception in society? 
Yeah, and I think Gillies also struggled internally at the very beginning as he moved into cosmetic realms because he wondered if this was an ethical way to make money, for instance. But he also talks about how even a slight imperfection for someone could have a huge impact on their their mental state. And he would say, who is he to decide whether they should change that about themselves? He really believed that people should con- control their identities. An extraordinary story is in 1940, he performed the first phalloplasty, which is the construction of a penis, on a trans man named Michael Dillon. So that, that was in 1949. What had happened was Gillies was very well placed to do this when Michael Dillon approached him because he had been working on genital reconstruction of sailors and soldiers who had been injured during the Second World War. So Gillies undertook this case, and eventually Michael Dillon was outed by the British press. It was a really sad story. He was driven from Britain. Um, but Gillies stood by him. And again, it, it went back to his belief in being able to control your identity, you know, whether it was restoring your identity through facial reconstruction or it was helping you to improve your appearance through cosmetic tweaking or surgeries or whether it was, you know, through these groundbreaking surgeries such as the phalloplasty he performed for Michael Dillon. Michael Dillon's story is a very contemporary one, and this was, you said, 1949? 49. 49. 49. Yes, 1949. I think a lot of people will be surprised um, that it was it, it, that that kind of operation had been successfully performed that early on, um, but you know he was he continued to do reconstructive work. Um, there was the fact this is something I learned in the course of my research was that in the 1920s women began removing facial hair with X-rays, which is a really bad idea, um, and they developed cancers on their faces, and so these surgeons would go in and have to remove the cancer, and in the process they would disfigure these women, and a lot of them ended up in Gilly's care. So I do just a little bit of that in the epilogue as well. I think that if Gillies lived today, he'd be really interested in face face transplants, um, this new technology, which is both reconstructive surgery as well as transplant surgery. Um, And he would continue to push those boundaries as he did in the past. Harold Gillies lived until September of 1960. uh, And I'm wondering, uh, did he practice almost until the end of his life? He did. In yeah. fact, he, he suffered a, a, a small stroke while he was operating on a patient. The patient was fine. Um, Gillies lived, I believe, for another month after that incident. So he really he really died as he lived, you know, trying to help patients all the way till the very end. How are his professional contributions viewed a- a- across history at this point? Well, I think in plastic surgery, certain certainly surgeons recognize him as sort of the grandfather of modern plastic surgery. And they know about his legacy and they know about Gillies. I think the general public know less about him. In Britain, his cousin Archibald McIndoe sort of overshadowed Gillies' legacy in the Second World War because McIndoe was the one to operate on the guinea pig club. That was these the, that was these pilots who were terribly burned and they called themselves the guinea pigs, the most exclusive club in the world. They even had little pins that they wore in their uniforms. I believe there are still some guinea pigs still alive even. And there was a lot of media attention around the guinea pig club in the second world war there was a lot of romance around the pilots of the second world war and so really archibald mackendo's work eclipses um harold gillies but it was really gillies who introduced his cousin to the strange new art of plastic surgery so it's my hope really that i can uh allow gillies to live again in the public imagination and people can learn about his extraordinary work but i do hope that if people pick up the face maker they don't just think that i've done harold gillies story justice, but also the disfigured soldiers' stories justice, because it's as much about them as it is about Harold Gillies. If Dr. Joseph Lister was the antecedent in many ways to Dr. Gillies' story, is there the next step for you in a story that you see as a logical progression from Gillies to another tale you want to tell? I mean, I don't, I don't really, I don't pick story. It's not like a trilogy, the trilogy is coming, you know, of medical history. I always go where the story is. You know, I am a medical historian by training, but I always go where the story is. And so my next book is called Sleuth Hound, and it is about a surgeon named Joseph Bell, who was the real life inspiration for Sherlock Holmes. He was Arthur Conan Doyle's professor, and it's going to be a fun romp through Victorian forensics and all of the uh, the wonderful kind of real-life characters who served as inspiration for these fictional characters along the way. Back to the Victorian era. Is there something about, exactly. the, is that, is there something about that time that particularly interests you? 
Well, it's also it's a bit easier. As I said, I don't have to navigate complicated, you know, patient uh, confidentiality. I really always felt that Harold Gilley's story should be told in a bigger commercial way so that a non-specialist audience could connect with that story. But it was such an undertaking. And, you know, it took me five years to write that book. So I'm hoping Sleuthhound will be a bit quicker. Um, I've been working my way through his 500 page diary at the moment. And it, and I, I think it's just going to be really fun for people to learn about Victorian forensics through this character. And in fact, his grand grandfather was the one who discovered Bell's palsy. So it's named after Charles Bell. So he comes from a, a very interesting medical background and it's it's going to be really fun to write. When do you anticipate that one will be out? Oh, I, I have to I have to finish with the face maker right now. So probably in, in about three years. But next year, I also have a children's book coming out called Scourge. Uh, my husband is an illustrator and caricaturist. So it's going to be an illustrated romp through medical history. Uh, I always say that I've I've horrified the adults. I'm coming for your kids <laughs> next year to teach them about medical history and history's strangest diseases and the things that doctors tried to do to help people in the past. Well, the current book is called The Facemaker, A Visionary Surgeon's Battle to Mend the Disfigured Soldiers of World War One. Dr. Lindsay Fitzharris is on book tour in Los Angeles right now. So thank you so much for joining us by Zoom for this conversation about your book. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me on. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A. And subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts so you'll never miss an episode. And while you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. You can also send us an email about Q&A at podcasts at c-span.org. Send me your questions, your comments, or ideas. Your feedback is welcome.